This week on the Computer Chronicles, 3D graphics. We'll show you the difference a 3D accelerator card can make on your computer. You'll find out how to use 3D objects in presentations, ads, web pages. We'll show you a great new 3D modeling tool called Poser 3. And want to know how they do all those cool 3D effects in TV commercials? We'll show you the software. Plus, a look behind the scenes at PDI, the computer animation shop that made the movie Ants. And my pick of the week, a webcam that doesn't require the web. It's all coming up next on The Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is brought to you by BigStar.com, with thousands of videos and DVDs for the whole family. Additional support by TechWeb, for up-to-the-minute technology news. And by TVA, Television Associates, bridging the worlds of computers and video with DVD authoring and MPEG encoding services. Hi, and welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffee. Well, I guess it was about 30 years ago that 3D movies were the rage. You put on those funny glasses and watched spears coming out at you from the movie screen. Well, 3D is a hot topic now in computers, but we're talking about a different kind of 3D. You don't need glasses, just the ability to take advantage of the depth of objects, the ability to move objects around in three-dimensional space. It takes hardware and software to do that, and we're going to begin by focusing on the hardware. Brian, you guys have a 3D accelerator card called the Voodoo, or the Voodoo 2 now, I guess, is what we're using. What does a 3D accelerator card do for me? Why should I buy one and put it in my PC? Well, the 3D accelerator allows you to offload the graphics fun functions from the Pentium and the, the 2D card. And so you have a dedicated graphics processor, which can give you better frame rates and uh, better special effects. All right, so it's going to work faster, and therefore it's going to allow me to see things essentially I couldn't otherwise see? Correct. All right, let's try to demonstrate that. Quake is a, thought of as a 3D game, if you will. You move around in 3D space, but most people play it in a very flat kind of 2D environment. And let's sort of do a before and after and show us the difference. Okay, what you're seeing here then is without a 3D effects accelerated card, you're running off of your 2D card in the Pentium here. And you get an okay game experience. It's a little bit blocky as you That's see. It's pretty crummy looking when you get close, as we know. And then as you see the, uh, the men further away, you can't, you can't pick out a lot of the details. But now if I switch to the 3D mode and allow it to load up, you get a much higher quality picture oh, that's a and big color depth. Isn't it? And there's special features like the colored lighting that just wouldn't be present in a software-only version. Uh -huh. So you get a better game experience, better visuals. It's totally different looking, really, isn't it? Yep, so much faster also. All right, now there's another example I want to ask you about. You know, for gamers, you think about, well, there's arcade quality games, and then there's sort of Sony PlayStation quality, and there's a PC, and there's a battle over where you get the best quality. Can you get actually the top kind of quality in terms of the 3D effect on a PC if with a 3D card? You actually get a much better game experience from a PC with a 3D effects card installed. There are arcade games which use Voodoo graphics in the arcade, right. and then there's console systems which use their own dedicated graphics processors. But what you get with the 3D effects is a better game experience, better resolutions, more polygon counts, better textures. And so we're seeing a lot so of... So you can actually get not only as good, but better quality on your computer if you're using a 3D card. Yes, faster and higher resolutions. So what you're seeing is games that are coming from the arcade space and from the console space and doing better on the PC. Uh -huh. All right, now NFL okay. Blitz, which you're loading up right now, is a hot game. We've seen it in the arcades. Everybody's playing this thing and dumping the quarters in there mm -hmm. right now. And this is what it would look like on a PC with a 3D card. Yeah. Which is pretty darn good. Yeah, it's four times the resolution of the arcade version at a faster frame rate with better textures. Well, let's, let's see a little bit more of the action. So we're sort of in demo mode here. Yeah. Oh. All right, yeah. That's so it's, it's an arcade perfect conversion. The game itself is very similar. All right, now let's talk about another application. Uh, I know you have Lego Chess up here now. Inherently, chess is a 3D game, but we tend on a computer to play it in a t 2D space. Again, show us what the difference would be if we did that in real 3D. Well, this is one of the exciting aspects of what's happening now, is we're starting to broaden the depth of content away from just the entertainment side, mm -hmm. which is people think of in traditionally 3D, right. and now bringing in the 2D aspects. So solitaire and chess, things that are 2D traditionally, can now be played on a 3D accelerator. Mm -hmm. It helps draw in um, educational titles and entertainment type things like chess as well, so that the children can get a better understanding of how things work. All right, so we're loading up Lego chess right now? Correct. And this has just now been released to the market, mm -hmm. and it uses the 3D effects to its full extent. All right, so we've got LEGO Chess up on the computer now, and tell us uh, why it's better as a 3D experience. Well, what you get is a traditionally 2D game that is now more presentable to kids and other people. As you start to look at it, you're immersed in a 3D environment, and with the familiarity of LEGOs, 
you make it a little bit easier to understand and play. And we see, obviously, as they should in chess, these guys are moving forward and backward and left and right and really on that 3D board. All right, one last thing I want you to show us, which is just kind of fun. You're actually applying 3D to screensavers, where you get kind of a different fun experience there also. Right. Uh, get that one up. So what we're doing is uh, working with um, different kinds of applications in terms of business, as uh -huh. well as on a normal PC. So 3D is more than just games, you're saying? Right. And so what we have an example of is a Voodoo Light screensaver. So instead of seeing your normal windows flying at you on your screen, right. you now get a 3D experience, and it looks much, much more compelling. All right. Well, it's certainly a lot of fun, anyhow, to see stuff coming in and out there. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Well, it's very cool to add 3D to your computer games, as we saw, but there's a lot more to 3D graphics than just games, as Brian said. You can often simply communicate better using three-dimensional objects. A very good example is a new package of 3D goodies called Live Art 98. And Ben, you're our expert right there. Yes. Let me ask you, it looks sort of like a collection of clip art. Explain why this is better to have these things as 3D objects. Well, what we've done is we've actually taken some fairly advanced 3D technology, combined it with 3D objects to give people who are not necessarily very technically adept right. the ability to generate lots and lots of different kinds of images from the same piece of art um, with the, that really look like they are, All right, so uh, for example, I pull up this little yellow ducky thing from right. the collection of clip art, and normally it just sort of sits there and I can use it or not use it, right? right. But what can I do now that it's really a 3D object, not just a piece of art? Right, well, the thing that, that il Illustrator would love to do this that, this that they can't is to actually take this object okay. and make it be whatever angle that you would like it to be, or if you'd like to change the lighting so that you get a different look. You can actually go in with very, very simple interface and change and the again, lighting. And again, the source of the light and the direction of the light is going to make the object look different. Exactly. And we can change, we can actually change the style so that it looks like it's a whole different artistic look. So I can go from here to make it look like it was drawn by a, uh, uh -huh. a crayon, or I can even make it look like it's a pointillist style. Um, let's go over to the pointist down here. So go. the difference is, again, this is not just a collection of flat art. It's a collection of really 3D objects, right. which I can then use as pieces of art. Right. Now, how do I actually use these things? What, what's, what's the point in having this stuff? Um, well, let me give you an example. Okay. Um, I, I recently got married, so, so th this kind of thing is on my, is on my <laughs> mind. Um, we've got a web page here that is a, is a, is a love note to, to, to someone, and it, right. it's you know, text heavy and, and obviously needs Obviously this. dying for a piece of uh, art. Dying for a piece of art. So I'm going to go over here, and I'm going to go and I'm going to search. And actually, this time, I'm going to search based on the concept of love. So you can actually search your, your collection of art by word. Exactly. What's any stuff that, that has the word love related right, to it? Right, love related to it. And it's actually <laughs> going to find, among about 4,000 objects, um, a whole bunch of different things. We've got roses. We've got um, That's pretty clever. I mean, love's cherubs. not in the title, but it knows it's sort of love it, related. It looks for the system. synonyms and it okay. looks for keywords. And here, let's, let's take a look. There's a very simple kind of Valentine's like okay. object. We'll just insert that in place. We can take it and... Um, now again, you can rotate that. It's not just a piece of flat art. We can increase the size and uh -huh. it's going to rotate and we rotate it and it is re-rendering this so thing maybe in real get, time. Yeah, maybe get a more attractive sort of angle of it. Okay. Right. So and then, pick one you like. Then we'll just take it and we can actually export it into lots of different file formats. JPEG, mm -hmm. bitmap, TIFF, for either web or for um, okay. uh, non-web use, for desktop publishing. And use. you could just take that thing now and just drop it back into and that boring we'll go, text page we go back up over, over to our little thing here before and we just insert the image and we'll take it, you know, play little Julia Child here and here's mm -hmm. our hearts and there we have the, the same now, now quickly, can you get back, you had that image of kind of a woman at a desk, could we see that a second? Because oh, that would be a good example if you, sure. if you rotated that. You can actually see the space between objects, and that would be a, uh, something you might put in a PowerPoint presentation. Right, right, right exactly. I mean, the, the idea is that each um, illustration actually has um, a bunch of different, you know, in, in the same way that a, that a photographer can take one uh -huh. image and really so see So you can a lot just of, uh, go, look, spin that thing around like you did the, the little rubber ducky there. Right, and we get lots of It's a totally different, different piece of art as you right. move that thing around. So, so even though we've got 4,000 objects, each of those yeah. objects with the different styles. is an infinite number an of infinite objects, number. really. Now, let's go to the last point. I talked about PowerPoint. One cool thing is to have animated objects inside a presentation. Exactly. And you can actually animate some of these 3D objects uh, with the software. Exactly. Console. About th uh, about 300 of the objects that are in live art actually have animation built into them. And they're, they're human form animations. Uh -huh. There's you know, little chattering teeth. It, it depends on what's <laughs> appropriate. You know, what, what is it that, that helps you illustrate the point right. that you're trying to illustrate? And the whole idea here is to make stuff so that people who were not necessarily artistically skilled but who had artistic taste could generate stuff that was unique to them. Now, can I go in and actually manipulate that image and change what it does? You can actually go in and, and rotate this image around, and even though it looks like it's a 2D illustration, it has all of the flexibility that yeah. the 3D illustration has. So we can turn him up on his head. <laughs>
Well, once again, certainly a lot of fun. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you very much. All right, well, if you saw the movie Toy Story, you know the difference between old-fashioned two-dimensional animation and modern computer-generated 3D animation. Well, the latest achievement in 3D movie animation is the film Ants. To find out how you do that kind of 3D work, we visited the place where it was all created, Pacific Data Images in Palo Alto, California. Hi. Want to dance? Absolutely. The feature film doing? Ants marked a new era in computer animation. The electronic look and feel of earlier films, such as Tron, was gone. The characters in this film, insect or other, had human-like expressions and movements that were uncannily real. Much of the visual magic came not from Hollywood, but from Pacific Data Images, or PDI, located in Silicon Valley. PDI was founded almost 20 years ago, when conditions were different. When I started the company in 1980, there was no market and there was no technology, but it was clear that that was going to happen. And in 1985, it was the same thing, that the technology certainly wasn't there to do it. You know, I, I think we had 52 computer years of rendering or something like that in ants. Um, you know, in 1985, everyone had one computer. So you'd say, well, it'll take us half a century to make this movie. The Ants Project was a kind of proving ground for new techniques made possible by an increase in computing power and a new approach to bring human attributes to otherworldly characters. People don't know what a talking ant looks like, and we had a little bit of liberty. We, we made sure they know what a talking face looks like, and there were a lot of things um, in ants that I think we did really well. If you turn the sound off on ants and you watch the character, you can actually read their lips and you can read their mind and tell what they're thinking. And there are, there are points in the film where they say one thing and you know they're thinking another just because of their, the expression on their face. Now we have to do that to real human characters. And so, you know, the bar is raised with that. It's basically have a human muscles un underneath the skin of the, uh, of the character. So when we do a little smile, we're actually contracting a uh, different part of the muscle to come up with a smile. And also the same thing, what, like when we do a little eyebrow movement like that, we're actually contracting the muscle here and then uh, contracting the muscle up here. One way that PDI tries to keep the creative juices flowing is by encouraging their animators to create their own in-house short film projects on their own time. Through them, PDI hopes to push the established borders of animation, both in technique and in technology. I try to like do something besides just working on a job or doing commercials or doing special effects for feature film. Um, so it's, it's very personal. It, I got to be my own boss. I can write the story I want. I can make the animation the way I want. And um, it's just fun doing that. The short film subjects vary dramatically, from cuddly cats to sinister monsters, but they feature innovative ideas that are uncompromised by the demands of the mass market. Well, I was looking for something that wasn't necessarily happy and Disney-like. Uh, I wanted to do something that was a little bit, like I said, more foreboding, a little bit more contrasty, a little bit more, a little scary perhaps, something a little bit more challenging in terms of visuals. The computer may have a starring role in today's animated films, but many animators still begin with hand-drawn storyboards and handmade models. The fact you're using the technology is, it isn't the point, but to use them creatively in a way that's really going to um, allow people some artistic freedom and latitude, uh, that's, that's the fun stuff. While the computer's meticulous realism provided PDI with technology for a new generation of films, the company first had to overcome Hollywood's reluctance to try anything new. The interesting thing is, in addition to the technology, both the hardware and the software, there was a coming of age of the entertainment industry for them to be willing to finance and distribute this kind of product. Tim Johnson, who was one of our directors on Ants, uh, Tim and I went around to a lot of studios in the late 80s, early 90s and pitching ideas for films. And universally we're met with people saying, who's going to sit through an hour and a half of computer animation? For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Sarah O'Brien.
One of the goals of 3D graphics is to create lifelike objects, to be able to give those objects depth, expression, motion, so they seem real. And believe it or not, you can do a lot of this stuff now on your PC. And Steve, you've got an example of that here with Poser 3, which lets you do just incredible things. I mean, give us an example of the interface here and the kind of ways you can make bodies and faces move here. Well, you know, you pointed it out. Poser 3 is a human reference tool that takes uh, 3D models, about 40 of them, of animals and people, and allows you to go in and move the figures. And based on real people and real exactly. animals and how they normally move. Yeah, these models are actually so explicitly de developed. They were uh, created by a company called Zygote Media Group. And uh -huh. in some cases, they're actually like medical level reference So models. you're real time saying, hey, make mm -hmm. her squat, make her move, make her exactly. lean or whatever, and then go right back to the real model, and there she is. I'm working with a full inverse kinematic engine here. Uh, can move the figure around, changing cameras as well. We can go into different camera modes like a side view, uh, go back to the like a hand camera so we can actually. Now, a couple things I want you to show me. Let's mm -hmm. go to the face. I mean, you can mm -hmm. actually get people to talk and to, and to sync up their mouth and their lips and their teeth with what they're saying, right? Yeah, totally. And it's so wild to be able to do that. We simply go into the library where we mm -hmm. find poses, faces, hair, hands. And let's go open up the faces and we just double click on like this blink position. I want here. a blink. And here we have like a blink or, or a smile, yeah. for example. Um, well, now you're talking about character animation. You want right. to work with phonemes. And phonemes are the basic lips, teeth, and tongue positions sure. that are used to so create I say a sound. Mm or F like an, or S or whatever. Exactly. As a matter of fact, you have like an L sound here. If you think about how an L is made, your uh, teeth are like right, forward up right. top and your tongue is touching the lower So again, you don't have to you. figure this stuff all exactly. out. I mean, it comes with the phoneme exactly. library. Now you can go in and select the head and actually, let, let's say that we wanted to add a little bit more of a mm -hmm. smile in here. We could simply just dial up a little bit of a smile so we so can make a smile and say L, L at, at the, the same, same time. time. Yeah, it's very, very cool to be able to do that. Now, one of the hard things to deal with is hands, and mm -hmm. you have the ability to actually create a particular position of the fingers and so on. Show us exactly. That one. Let's go to one of the hands here. Now, if I go in and grab the base of the hand here, I have a grasp channel. Mm -hmm. And if I go in and slide the grasp, you'll notice that the hands are moving. We're in a box shaded mode because I'm running on a laptop yeah. here. But let's go look at the hand libraries. This is actually something I wanted to point out to you here. Um, we have a series of pictures of hands, and you just double click on these to apply them. Now, what's really nice is we actually included a full set of American wow. Sign Language hands. So let's say you wanted That's to amazing. animate between hands, yeah. so you could use ASL. All right, now, we don't have mm -hmm. nearly enough time to mm -hmm. show all this up. Let's get to the end product here, because okay. you have some incredible finished products that were created on Poser that I want you to show us. All right, you like movies, right? Uh, let's, yeah, let's, let's, see let's look at a couple of movies. Everybody was this one's a, a fun one I like. All done on, I mean, what's what, $200 piece of software? Exactly. Yeah, yeah this is done by using uh, BBH motion capture files, which are sampled human motion, and then it's rendered over a background image, and then the yeah. sound has been imported to give it some Okay, quick, stuff. let's grab a couple of the, okay. these others and take right, a look You at know, them. we were talking a little bit about uh, character animation. If you think about, like, the saying names, yeah. the words my, okay. it's an M and an I sound strung together. Now, here we have an animation that's... Uh, my, my, my. Here we go. Pretty very, good. very easy. Now, yeah. you can also make like the animals talk. So here we have the dolphin. My, my, my. Isn't that cool? I see myself making my commercials right yeah, now. Yeah, totally, totally. <laughs> of course, I. That's Poser 3. Yeah, pal. there's my plug. All right. Yeah. So um, <laughs> okay, we have a horse? beautiful horse here. This is a really nice animation. Uh, let's go set this up. It's set up to loop. That's so smooth. Isn't that beautiful? Now, this actually is an animation that's included on the CD. Uh -huh. um, so you can get a sample as to how to create animations like yeah. such as horses. Now, you've got one other kind of finished little story you've created. I think it's Sneak. Is that, is that yeah, the one? Yeah, that's right. Um, kind of a little movie? Let's open that one can you up find here. That? Yes, I can. Um, yeah, the Sneak is kind of neat because it uses a combination between character animation, um, motion capture data, and it sort of tells a little story about this poser figure becoming, I guess, self-aware here. Uh, He's, sort of, he's realizing he's Truman. Exactly. Uh, on a exactly. TV show. Totally. He sees us. <laughs> Here he is. No. Of course, that was the high tech sound of recording the sound of knocking on a screen. <laughs> right? I like this effect. This, these animations were created by a guy named Joe Grover and Mark who did some You got your sumo stuff. baby real fast, oh, maybe yeah, about 20 yeah, seconds? Yeah, exactly. Let's, that's, that's so funny. Let's, this is the sumo baby. You know, um, the dancing baby has become right. so like, famous, and everybody wants to do a dancing baby. Well, here you can do it in Poser 3. Okay. So this is the kind of thing you could create with this software. So, okay. Really you get beautiful tired of the normal baby, and you yeah, got a little violence exactly. in you. Yeah. Oh, jeez. That's great. 
Steve, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank All you. All right. Well, it's hard to watch a TV commercial or a movie these days without seeing the amazing advances in 3D graphics from the M&M television ads, Babylon 5 TV series, blockbuster movie Titanic. What these all have in common is a very powerful piece of software called Lightwave 3D. And Brad, that's your baby here. This is done. This is you got a workstation going here right that's now. That's correct. And this is a little more high end, right? Maybe a couple of thousand bucks About for like two thousand dollars. But you can do anything, right? Absolutely, you have complete three D freedom. Just get, uh, is again impossible to do this in four minutes. But just run us through the process of creating uh, a complicated scene like that with Lightwave. Okay, well, there's several different steps to the three D animation process. The first one is, of course, building your models. And what we like to do is set up a paradigm of working with kind of hunk of clay. Exactly. So I can take that, we can squish it, it down. squeeze it, shape it. Exactly. We can pull some points out. And if I want to go ahead and go in here and you know maybe make the nose a little longer, I can do that. Um, cut it in half then start working on just one half of the object. Then what I can do is, once I've got that shaped the way I like it, I can mirror that across. And you got yourself a dog now. Exactly, sort of. and I've got sort of the little uh, friend that you might recognize we play our little movie that's here. That's right. <laughs> so there's a little guy there. So that's something that's you can a, create. That. Amazing, from a, from a hunk of clay. Absolutely. All right, now build up this whole scene you have in here, which is, which is just amazing. Okay, and this is one of the real advantages of Lightwave 3D. Um, very pervasive, as you mentioned, in television and film. In fact, only about 50% of that market space. But the reason is it's very well integrated in with the video world. So, so what are we really looking at here, What Brad? you're seeing here is a wireframe with some solid shaded, what we call... So you're representing the background scene. Absolutely. So we have some real, or some virtual objects here. And then we have some buildings that look kind of cheesy because they're just boxes, right? Yeah, but you've added the billboard, say, you've added the chopper moving. We've added the, uh, the light post, and then what we wanted to do is have a full street. So we took a digital camera, uh -huh. and rather than building this entire world, we're able to go ahead and take that plate and drop it into the background. Okay, so and that's the background you're working with, which again was originally just a still. Correct, just one still but frame. But you're going to use it to create a whole animated scene. An entire scene. world, and what we want to do is add lots of subtle nuances in there, like right, clouds. Like what? So let's go ahead and take a look. We start off with our with That's our plane. That's the plane still. Yep. So the first thing we added was you can see if we go back and forth here, our okay, lamp post. So you had a billboard, but there's a little billboard. guy up there now. Is he moving? He's actually animated. Uh, so let's you can have him painting on the billboard. Yeah. Let's go ahead and uh, add the rest of the elements here. You can see we've got some 3D clouds using our hypervox. And again, there's motion technology. with these clouds. They're going to go by. The exactly. Sky. And then the final element is of course the helicopter. And itself. we see the shadow, for instance, on yep. the building. So let's take a look at that uh, in action here, and we'll just go ahead and fire up our little movie. And you can see now as the helicopter comes across, it reflects in the one building, and then of course casts a shadow on the other one. Now you notice also up here you mentioned the little guy. This little guy is actually he's moving. On, the clouds guy. are moving. The chopper's little. moving. And you've taken this dead flat scene and turned it into real life. Yeah, and that's I mean, exactly the type of effect you've seen in the layering you would see in something like Titanic or right. Armageddon, where they're adding these multiple things. Brad, how, how long would it take? I mean, how complicated is it for somebody to do something like that? I mean, you're an expert and it's sort of pre-done here, but, but can I do something like that? Sure, sure. There's some uh, elements like this you could do probably in a couple days. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, for someone who's just getting started, they might want to start off. We have another program called Inspire 3D. Okay, what's that? It's a very similar application to Lightwave 3D, although it's targeted more at multimedia, web page, and hobbyists. All right, and that's what, a couple hundred bucks range? about $350. And this can... is like a 2000 bucks for exactly. Lightwave 3D? Exactly, exactly. But there is an upgrade path, so if you want to move on, you right. can do that. But the nice thing is, you can get started. It's got a great tutorial CD, and it takes you through all the processes, not just of Inspire 3D, but of regular 3D graphics. So from the complete neophyte, they can get started and within a few hours be making incredible graphics. So I can actually take something like this and do those sort of, as you said, I mean, this is Titanic, this is the, the, the M&M's commercial, all created real. Now, do I need a very, you're using a, a kayak workstation, kind of expensive box here. Do you need that? You don't actually need that. We could run on uh, Intel machines. You could. Power Mac machines. Uh -huh. um, we this actually, might take a little longer. Yeah, you can use, well, the G3 laptops actually will uh -huh. render faster than a lot of the <laughs> high-end workstations. So it's amazing what desktop computers can do. Amazing stuff, Lightwave 3D. Thank you, Brad. All right, that's our look at 3D computer graphics. I'll be back in just a minute with my pick of the week. Now for my pick of the week. There are lots of webcams or computer video cams out there these days for people who want to put live video shots into their PCs or onto their websites. But most of these require a fair amount of complicated installation, plus some knowledge of how to run a website. But a company called Moonlight Products has just come out with a computer video camera that is unique. Here is why this little phone jack built into the back. In fact, this camera, the phone cam, has a built-in modem. So you don't even need a computer to use this, and you don't have to know anything about building websites or installing complicated video telephony software. You don't even need a web browser. This is a truly digital camera appliance, 
plug the power cord in, plug the phone line in, it works. Of course, you do need a computer somewhere in the chain so you can see the pictures. Here's how you do that. I have another phone cam set up right now in one of our offices. No computer there, just the phone cam plugged into a normal telephone jack. I can have the camera watching my house, a child, a parent, or a pet. Now, to check on what the camera is seeing, I just dial it up on my PC. You can program the camera to call you on a regular basis. You can call up new frames anytime you want or set it to continuous mode, which sends you one new frame per minute. You can catalog all the shots, even animate them. And you can adjust all the camera's parameters, such as color, aperture, brightness, and contrast by remote control. This is a very cool gadget. Best of all, it is easy to set up, easy to use, list prices under $400. That's it for this edition of the Chronicles. We'll be back here again next week with more of the latest on hardware, software, and the internet. Thanks for joining us. I hope we'll see you here next time. The Computer Chronicles is brought to you by BigStar.com with thousands of videos and DVDs for the whole family. Additional support by TechWeb for up-to-the-minute technology news. And by TVA, Television Associates, bridging the worlds of computers and video with DVD authoring and MPEG encoding services. To purchase a videotaped copy of today's program, call toll-free 1-888-310-7850. Please specify the show number and the topic. Next week on the Computer Chronicles, digital photography. We'll show you the hottest new camera, the Epson 750Z. You'll see the coolest new digital printer, the color shot from Polaroid, and the best digital imaging software that can turn even you and me into professional photographers. And we'll show you some great web resources that solve many typical photography problems. It's all coming up next week on the Computer Chronicles. <laughs>